Today's lecture is a continuation of the previous three lectures. This is the fourth and last installment of core log integration. Please follow us on YouTube, check out the previous videos, and hopefully you will enjoy formation evaluation. All the best and thank you for watching this. Hello again, here we are. This is the last part of the sequence of core log integration lectures, part four and last. I hope you like the lectures and I hope you learn a lot from them. It's certainly a pleasure to be here conveying these very interesting and important concepts. And today we're going to talk about core log integration for the very specific case of an unconventional sedimentary sequence, the eagle port shell. Just to remind you, we are going to go through the various formations that bound the eagle four. We have at the top the Austin chalk, then the eagle four proper. We have the upper eagle four formation, and then we have the lower eagle four formation, which is where we have the maximum concentration of organic content and immediately below that we have the Buda formation and below that we have the Del Rio formation. The well logs that we have through the Eagle Ford, here we have an example, uh, gamma ray, spontaneous potential, caliper, pit size, and then electrical resistivity induction, deep resistivity in red, shallowest resistivity, the RT10 in blue, then we have the density, the neutron logs expressed in limestone porosity units, the photoelectric factor log, and core porosities. An incredible number of core porosity measurements blocks all across this segment. And then we also have measurements of core permeability. Uh, all of these segments going from 10 to the minus 4 all the way to the 10 to the 4 millidarsis. When we look at the gamma ray log, we see that we have increased activity in the gamma ray log where the values reach the maximum at the boundary between the lower Eagle 4 formation and the Buda formation. We're going to see this discontinuity in the core uh, viewing study that we're going to conduct today. Um, we also see increasing values of resistivity in the lower Eagle 4, which is where we have the maximum concentration of organic material. And here on the neutron and density porosity logs, we also see the maximum porosity relatively high. This is the core porosity precisely in the lower Eagle 4 formation. So we're going to see this. It's very important to understand the cyclicity of these changes. It is also very important to understand the geomechanical properties of these rocks because remember that most of these um, fields are developed with a vertical well from which one does all the petrophysical analysis, determines one determines the presence or not presence of organic material, the degree of maturation, so forth and so on. But it is in this area where the horizontal wells are drilled, where you have the maximum concentration of organic material. So a horizontal well will go here, and then hydrofractures will be uh, done, performed here, and the propagation of those hydrofractures will have to do, will be determined by the mechanical properties that, of the rocks that we have in this area. So. It's also a function of the in-situ stress, the pore pressure, a number of things. So it's very important to, to also, in addition to recognizing um, compositional properties of the rocks, also to understand the 
mechanical properties of them. So we're going to look into that. Here is an outgrub of the Austin chalk. As I said before, the Austin chalk is immediately above the Eagle Fork formation. The Austin chalk has been charged with hydrocarbons in some places. And there are some towns in South East Texas that produce hydrocarbon from the Austin chalk. And here is a beautiful outcrop of the Eagle Four formation, where we have at the top the upper Eagle Four, and then we have the lower Eagle Four, which is at the bottom here, that has the organic content. A close-up view of this lower Eagle Four formation will reveal the presence of organic material as shown here. Obviously, the Eagle Four uh, in this example is no longer charged, uh, extreme degree of maturation, but <clears throat> there are places of the Eagle in the Eagle Four that we have very light hydrocarbons, uh, um, condensates, light oil, and then there are other places where we have gas. The well that we're going to look at today, the core data comes from a well that was um, drilled in the Eagle Four formation, very close to the border with Mexico and Texas, and that well produces gas from the Eagle Four formation. So this is an organic shell. It's the source rock of many other reservoirs. And here is a, an outgroup of the Buda formation at the top. So the Eagle Four will be above this and then below the Buda formation we have the Del Rio formation. Buda formation outcrops in the town of Buda, Texas, which is not is to the south, very close to the to Austin, to the south of the Austin. And uh, the name is actually very interesting because it comes from the Spanish name Viuda, which means widow. But I guess they couldn't pronounce Viuda. Uh, there was a Buda in that town, by the way, it's Spanish speaking. But I guess they could not produce uh, pronounce uh, Buda, and they call it Buda. Well, that's the origin of the name. Now, here's another um, outcrop, photograph of this outcrop where we have below, again, the Del Rio formation. Here is a, a photograph of some of the core samples that we're going to be looking at precisely in that well that we're going to look at called Cinco Saus. That well here is the gamma ray log, here are the resistivity logs, the neutron density logs expressed in limestone process units. And then we have the spectral gamma ray logs where the uranium component here is plotted with the purple color. And then we have the permeability of the samples in the scale that I mentioned before. Here we have the porosity plugs. And here is the boundary. At, above this we have the Eagle Four, and below that we have the Buda formation. It's an incredible um, contrast in, in the gamma ray logs that we see here. Uh, here's another photograph of the same rendering of the core samples that we're going to be looking at at the boundary between the Eagle Four, the lower Eagle Four formation, and the Buda formation. We are also going to look at some of these uh, photographs done with uh, customary light, uh, ambient light, and with ultraviolet light here. And some of these rocks, when they are shine with ultraviolet light, they reflect or absorb different wavelengths of the spectrum of visible light. And then we can see in this example for here at 3,621.5 and 0 .5 feet, the glowing nature of this volcanic material we're going to see. And we're going to have an expert, Dr. Toti Larson, explain to us the origin of this volcanic material in the Eagle Four formation. Here is the plot of the Eagle Four um, shell. It's a highly laminated uh, fissile shell that has uh, an iso exhibits an isotropy in electrical conductivity and isotropy in elastic properties because of the high degree of laminations and there's also great variability in the composition of these um, of this shell. 
organic shale. Here is another plot of a comparison, another photograph comparison of uh, normal light, ambient light versus ultraviolet light. And what we see, of course, with the ultraviolet light is not only the very good differentiation between the segments that have organic material, but also a very distinct reflection, reflectance coming from the presence of volcanic material. So we'll see some of these uh, in, the, in the lecture today. The well logs that we're going to be look at, we're going to be looking at come from a well called Cinco Saos Creek, number one. This is very this is in the US state of Texas, very close to the border with Mexico. Now, I always contend that the name is not correct. The name should be Cinco Sauces. And Sauces is like a willow, Saus, willow. That's what it means. So it's uh, five willows. But my colleagues at the bureau continue to call it Cinco Saus. So I don't know. Somebody made a mistake with the spelling, but we're not going to belabor this point. What were the, the logs that we're going to be showing? This is the plot, the formation boundaries. We're going to have depths and feet. Same with the core measurements. Bear in mind that uh, the well logs here have already been shifted in depth to coincide with the depth of the core measurements. So, so the well logs have been depth matched to the core samples. That's an important point. So we have the gamma ray log, spontaneous potential to this well was drilled with water-based mud, caliper, and pit size. Then we have electrical resistivities. Bear in mind that the deep, deeper sensing induction electrical resistivity is the RT90, and then the shallowest sensing is the RT10. Then we have neutron density and neutron porosity logs expressed in limestone porosity units going from minus 10% to 30%. So we have 40 porosity units across. And then uh, both of them, as I said, are expressed in limestone porosity units. Here we have the photoelectric factor log and the core porosity uh, plotted with the same scale as the neutron and density porosity logs. And then we have spectral gamma ray logs, potassium in continuous black line. Then we have thorium in yellow and we have uranium in magenta. And the last track is for permeability, going from 10 to the minus 4 to 10 to the 4 millidarsy. Eight decades of variation of permeability. As we go down this well, and that's going down in depth, that's what we have in depth. We have, that's depth in feet, and then we have the gamma ray log, electrical resistivity, neutron density, core plugs, look at the intense number of them, neutron, I mean, uh, the spectral gamma ray logs and permeability. Please understand the, uh, the abnormal, normally high oscillations that the uranium log has because of the presence of organic material. And as we go down, we reach the uh, this blue figure here is for the upper formation, the Austin chalk, and then we enter the Eagle Four formation. So part of the coring took place in the Austin chalk and part of it in, or most of it took place in the Eagle Four formation. You're going to see that the porosities are extremely low here because of the location of the plugs. Also the coincidence of the neutron and density porosity logs expressed in sandstone porosity units is telling, uh, is telling us that in the Austin chalk, the dominant mineral composition is calcite. And here we're also going to be looking at the correlation between the uh, gamma ray logs and resistivity logs. So let's go move down. Now we continue to be in the Eagle 4 formation. We're going to look at the oscillations of this gamma ray log, what these oscillations mean in terms of the cyclicity of this organic shell. And now there are places where the composition of the dominant mineral composition no longer agrees with that of limestone because of the separation between the location of the core porosity with respect to the neutron and density porosities. And please observe how the very large 
degree of variability that we have in permeability. So we move here, we go deeper in the formation, and we see more of the same, more cyclicity, relatively smooth variations here. And now we move down, and this magenta section identifies the lower Eagle Four formation. That's where we have the organic material. Please look at how the gamma ray log begins to increase in values. The resistivity log also begins to increase in values. And in the spectral gamma ray logs, we see that the log that increases value moves more uh, predominantly is the magenta log, which is the uranium spectral gamma ray log. We also see that the dominant mineral composition is no longer um, limestone because of the departure of this material and that's to some extent because of the presence of organic material and also because we might have a diversity of grain uh, of minerals other than calcite and then as we go along we look at the gamma ray log continues to increase we see at the bottom that we have the maximum values of the spectral uranium log indicating that the maximum concentration of organic material is very close to the boundary with the Buda formation. And here is precisely where we have the boundary of the Buda formation. And when you go in the Buda formation, then suddenly the core measurements of porosity and the neutron and density logs expressed in limestone porous units coincide extremely well with the with themselves. So that means that the dominant mineral composition in the Buda formation is limestone. And that's what we're going to see. We have a tremendous amount of core measurements here, given by the number of core plugs that we have here. Each one of those represents a measurement of porosity, permeability, and other measurements, compositions, etc. So we're going to be looking at that. As we move down into the Buda formation, at some point we run out of places where we have core. Uh, things are very quiet with respect to the gamma ray log. Things are also very quiet with respect to the air resistivity logs, neutron density. And also we see that we don't have abnormally high concentrations of organic material until we reach the bottom of the well. So you have access to these well, to these logs in, in PDF format. We are going to be walking with them through the sections of the core. So please take them with you as we walk down in the core viewing facility. I also want to um, summarize a very important remark that I've been making throughout these four lectures. I had this remark at the beginning. I'm going to make it again. Never interpret well logs without looking at rocks, outcrops, core samples, drilling cuttings, all of the things that can give you reality checks so so we have to make sure because uh, interpreting measurements is subject to a significant amount of uncertainty sometimes so uh, parameters models all of these things they need to be adjusted and having access to core samples uh, uh, measurements of course allow us to uh, benchmark to verify the interpretations that's absolutely very important and this is the summary that I have been carrying from the first presentation. Please, I want to make sure that you understand that all of these are important points and that matching of core and well logs is very, very important. And I have the same review questions that I had on part three. Please take a look at them, follow them, and try to answer them. Those are the review questions. In closing, I would like to say thanks to, again, my friends Charlie Cairns, Doty Larson, Jerry Lucia, and I want to give a um, strong note of appreciation to the Bureau of Economic Geology, uh, to the Hildebrand Department of Petroleum and Geosystems Engineering for the support of this lecture series. So I'm very thankful to, for, to them. They actually paid for the expenses of laying out the core at the Bureau of Economic Geology. So all for the great tradition of education. I hope you like it. I hope it was worth it. And I hope you learn a lot. And more importantly, I hope you are enjoying the fascinating, wonderful subject of
for mission evaluation. For the layout of the uh, core log integration in the Cinco South as well, which is across the Eagle Fort, starting from the Austin Chalk at the top, or at the Austin Chalk at the top, and then the view of the formation at the bottom, we are going to be looking at logs with this property. So we have the gamma ray log, spontaneous potential, obviously this is a well that was drilled with water-based mud. Then we have the caliper bit size and we have the electrical resistivity. These are all electrical resistivities acquired with wireline logs. The uh, mnemonics indicate that this is a Schlumberger AIT induction tool. And then we have the porosity logs in limestone porosity units. We have the density log, neutral log, and the photoelectric effect. And we also have core porosity. All of these values are varying between minus 10% to 30%. Please pay attention to that. We're also going to be looking at spectral gamma ray logs, potassium 0 to 3% and thorium 0 to 15 parts per million and uranium 0 to 15 parts per million. And the last one is the permeability, which will oscillate between 10 to the minus 4. Yes, 10 to the minus 4 milliDarcy's to 10,000 milliDarcy's. So we have a great variability. So we're beginning, this part is the Austin Chalk. You're all go also going to see that the logs uh, describe the formation itself as the Austin Chalk. And as we move along, we are going to remember the scales. So here we have, again, resistivities go from 0.2 to 2,000. So we're going to be moving along these formations as we go through here uh, on occasion we're going to be looking at thin sections like the ones shown here these are thin sections that's scale 1000 micrometers and just to uh, indicate the scales the uh, micro features of these rocks the special analysis that is performed on them i'm going to show you something very interesting about these for log integration, we have two points here, which is a high, relatively high value gamma ray, relatively high value gamma ray log. Uh, this happens at about 3620 below that and below 3630. So what I, why do we have these relatively high peaks? And please note that also the thorium, uranium and thorium all equally increased, so they are playing as a team. And then we have relatively low values of resistivity, so what's going on here? So it turns out that these two peaks are correlated with the presence of volcanic material right here, and volcanic material right here. That's what we see. In fact, uh, people have come here to analyze these volcanic material and these are photographs that have been taken of the core that's where one of the peaks of gamma ray is and this is ultra ultraviolet light and what we do with ultraviolet light is that you shine it and then when you uh, depending on the reflectance of these properties when you shine it with ultraviolet light you get back a different wavelength and that's how 
this section shows that the presence of volcanics is shining back, so to speak, reflecting back a different type of wavelength, and that coincides with the presence of volcanics. Now, if we go to the previous segment over here, which is where we have the volcanic material, you are going to see also, that's the photograph right there of the same section, and then we have again here the ultraviolet light. And that's precisely where we have the first peak of the gamma ray log, and that's what we have here. So let me just show you again. These are the two peaks of the gamma ray log, presence of volcanics, presence of volcanic material, relatively low values of gamma of resistivity, relatively low val uh, high values of neutron and density porosity logs, and relatively high values, all three of the spectral gamma ray logs. That's what we see here, and that's a very interesting feature of correlation. Uh, so, in examples like this, it's very important to, to understand that these peaks of gamma ray log are not due to the presence of shell or clays. They are due, in this case, to the presence of abnormally high concentrations of thorium, uranium, and potassium because of presence of volcanoes. This section of the upper equal pore formation, as you can see from the samples here, is relatively quiet, very constant, it's extremely laminated. We see that the shell is very, very highly laminated. Uh, there is some variability in the composition. Of course, if you look at this in short or short distances, you are going to understand variability. You are going to see planes of mechanical weakness. That's where the rock breaks. We also see some variability in composition. But that's what we see across this upper Eagle Four formation. Now, if we return to the logs, you're going to see that, yes, there are some oscillations, but in general, the values are extremely constant. The values of resistivity are also extremely constant. If we had a tool that measures the resistivity parallel, parallel and perpendicular to bedding plane, probably we'll see very strong differences. Also, the porosity of the rock is fairly constant. And the neutron density, I mean, the uh, spectral gamma ray logs are very constant. We see uh, strong variations in permeability here, dominated by grain sizes. So, great oscillations in permeability, but please recall that the values of this scale are very, very small. As we move up or um, down, sorry, into the lower equal four formation we see spikes like this again spikes like this in the gamma ray log are in this example related to the presence of volcanic material we see several ash beds here and that's the origin of these spikes in the gamma ray log presence of volcanics but what is in interesting is that at some point here if you look at the spectral gamma ray logs suddenly the uranium component begins to increase. And why is that? Well, because of the presence of organic material. And that's where the organic material begins to be recognized on the well logs. We see several things. One is that, of course, the gamma ray log, standard gamma ray log increases. The resistivity increases because that, uh, the increase of organic material decreases the amount, the volume of water, or volume of water, and that increases the resistivity and we also see that the uranium component of the spectral gamma ray logs is increasing so all of that points to increasing concentrations of organic material and that happens if you look at the scales here we're looking at about 3870 and 3870 is about here this is where 3870 begins to take hold, and that's where the organic material begins to uh, increase, and this is what causes the lower Eagle Four formation, which is also we see presence of pyrite. Look at this presence of pyrite, presence of volcanic ash. Uh, 
the rock itself, if you look carefully here, is darker than in previous sections. If you look back here, I'm going to walk slowly here below, upper depth here, and you're going to see that the rock is slightly lighter in color. It's a shell because it's very low permeability class of rock, but the color is becoming darker and darker and darker. So we're at about 38, uh, 70, which is what I said before, 38, 70, which is here in this section, 71 is here. That's where we begin to see the slight increase of the uranium component of the gamma ray log, the resistivity is beginning to increase. So this is section is where we begin to have the maximum concentration of organic material. And that's a beautiful section because that will be the most important uh, financially viable section. And this is where folks will begin to drop their horizontal wells because that's where you have the maximum TOC concentration we have to analyze the level of maturity. Of course, this is a gas well, and based on, and we also have to analyze the geomechanical conditions that will be conducive to proper fractures, efficient fractures, so that we analyze whether these uh, hydrocarbons, in this example, gas and synchosauces in the Maverick Basin, would be um, financially viable or not. And uh, here we continue to be in the lower Eagle Four formation. I wanted to show you a couple of very interesting things. This, this local maximum of, of gamma ray log that we see here, it correlates extremely well with the presence of these volcanoes, volcanoclastic siltstone that we see here. That's where we see the values of gamma ray log. And this is not, of course, an organic material. So you can appreciate the level of complexity and mixing that this lower eco 4 formation has. I also want you to appreciate the fact that compared to the other sections that we saw in the upper and medium eco 4 formation, the, there's more variability per unit depth of the cycles of gamma ray log. That only indicates the variability of the rock. I also want you to appreciate that the values of electrical resistivity continue to climb slowly but surely over here. And we also have some variability on the porosity of the rocks. And last but not least, please note that on average, the uh, uranium component of the gamma ray log is increasing faster than the other two uranium, um, that sodium and potassium, I'm sorry. And we see that. There are places, for instance, that we see a local minimum, a local minimum of the gamma ray log and a local minimum of the gamma ray log. And those values, are actually very, very interesting. If you look carefully, they will be located at about 3883 and about 3890. 3883 and 90. And those are here. This is one of the sections over here. And 3890 will be somewhere in the vicinity here. And that's because obviously we have no organic material, somewhere in this section over here, no organic material, this is 93, and uh, so no organic material, and, and, and then that causes the gamma ray log to decrease. So obviously something is happening here that there are cycles where the rocks begin to lack organic material in some of the sections, and that has to do with the genesis and diagenesis of the rock. But as we continue through this analysis here, we realize that we're moving more and more toward the Buda formation here, and that will be the top of the Buda formation. What we see here is this is taking place close to 4,040. And I'm going to look at here, 4,040. Well, that's very close to what we see here. Well, below 4,040, uh, that's 40, that would be the 30, 35, so it's close there. And that's precisely what we read here. Look at this. This is 4,033, and that's precisely where the boundary is. 
It's a beautiful boundary in many respects. Again, that's the top of the Buda formation. That's where the Eagle Four formation ends at the bottom. And then we have the um, Buda formation. Please note that this is a segment that has the largest um, concentration of organic material. It's indicated by the uranium component of the gamma ray log. So, so this is where we have the maximum. And suddenly here we have the break. It's a beautiful break. And what happens? What happens at that break, at that discontinuity, at that unconformity is what I'm showing you here. At the top of this discontinuity, we have extremely high values of gamma ray log, excessive climbing of the uranium component of the gamma ray of the gamma ray log, and then suddenly the gamma ray log decreases to almost negligible values, and that's because the Buda formation is a carbonate formation. Also, the porosity of the Buda formation decreases, and as a consequence, the resistivity also increases. We, did, we see these cycles. But that's a marvelous, fascinating example of how the well logs, in this example, more, um, more than anything else, the gamma ray log exhibit a, a very sizable discontinuity at the boundary itself of this Eagle Four formation. That's a beautiful example of correlation between well logs and core samples. And the Buda formation in some places is loaded with hydrocarbons, obviously coming from the coming from the um, Eagle Four formation, but very often it has very low permeabilities and very low porosities as you can see here. And also it has some fragments of shell as you can see over here. So we have all of those possibilities but that's where the organic shell boundary takes place right there where I showed you before and it's a beautiful example a textbook example of how this variability of rocks is shown in on the logs and here we are at the Bureau of Economic Geology this is one of the temples of geological sciences. We are here at the core facility that has tons, it's like a library of core from all over Texas and some other parts of the world. If you ever want to look at rocks, interesting rocks, this is the place to come. Just showing you the facility here. But today we are here because we have an analysis to do, which is core log integration. And today we have one of the most uh, experienced scientists here at the Bureau of Economic Geology, a good colleague of mine. His name is Dr. Toti Larson. Hi, Carlos. How are you doing, Toti? Doing great. How are you doing? Fine. And you know, every time we, we've done a few things together, we've gone to Mexico, have tequila together. <laughs> but uh, he's an expert on geochemistry. He uh, formerly worked at Los Alamos National Laboratory. His PhD is in geochemistry. And he's been working a lot on the Eagle Ford formation. And thanks to him and his colleagues, we have access to this beautiful core data set that covers all the way from Buda formation to the Austin Chalk, going through all the segments of the Eagle Ford. And so I'm going to ask Tati to give us a few insights about what happened here. But let me just show you so that you see the beauty of this. These are the logs that we're going to be looking at. Um, gamma ray log resistivity, spectral gamma ray logs, porosity logs, but what I want to show you is that this happens precisely at the boundary of the Buda formation and the Eagle Ford. But I'm going to ask a few th things to uh, my colleague, super expert here, <laughs> to understand what happened. So, Toti, can you tell us the, 
the size of these core boxes is it typically two feet long? Yeah. So for this, uh, we call these uh, pizza boxes, which I think you can uh, see why. And in a in a pizza box, you get uh, five sections of core, and each section is about uh, two feet that's uh, recovered, and so it's a total of uh, ten feet of core. Uh, the top of the core being here, and the bottom of the core being here. Yes, and so they they have been slapped already, right? Yes, this is called the uh, the archive half, and it's just the the lower third. It's just a, a sliver, a third of the core. If you look around the back side of the core, you can see the the red and the, the black line, and we use that to help understand orientation. As you can appreciate, when these core are taken out of the field, uh, it can be a pretty hostile environment. And so the slab will come out, and then it'll mark it. And so if, if any piece gets moved later on in time, we can always go back and make sure it's oriented correctly with that side up rather than that. Um, another thing that you can see on the back, and it's something I do when I look at core, is look around the back, number one, make sure the lines are correct, that up is pointing up, and then see if any other samples have been uh, collected. Since this is an archive half, it means it's been polished on this side, and we don't allow anyone to uh, sample destructively on this surface. So if you want to sample destructively, you sample on the back half of the core. And what you can see here is somebody has gone through with a quarter inch drill and taken powder from that. And they may have measured uh, total organic carbon from it. Uh, they may have measured uh, x-ray diffraction for mineralogy. And so there's another data point there to um, learn more about the core. Excellent. Thank you. And then, of course, uh, initially this core, our whole core, it's yep. a cylinder. Whole core. What size of diameter of the borehole was, was here? Uh, it's about a three inch uh, diameter of the three core. Three inch, okay. Yeah. And so that's the size that we have. Yep. And then uh, you guys do a lot of laboratory studies on the core here at the Bureau of Economic Geology? Uh, we do, and you can tell by uh, how stickered this core is. Uh, we've conducted a lot of these measurements um, on the surface. And so again, if it's on the surface, it's non-destructive. Uh, we've built a, a lot of labs here, geochemical and uh, geomechanical labs and permeability porosity labs so that we can go in and do more detailed work and make the measurements ourselves. Excellent. So today we're going to be looking at this beautiful core sample, the Cinco Sauces. Can you uh, confirm this is in the Maverick Basin, right? Yes, this is a uh, Maverick Basin and this was collected uh, in Maverick County, uh, just near the border with Mexico. Yes, and geology has no borders, right? No, it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. So, so now we're going to go anywhere between the Buda Formation and the Austin Chalk. Buda at the bottom, Austin at the top. How many millions of years are we going to be looking at core? Uh, if we stay in the Eagleford, we're looking at about 8 million years. This boundary here is not exact, but it's, um, it's approximately 97 million years ago. Nice. Is the, uh, the unconformable contacts between the, the Buda, which is more of a chalk, and the lower Eagleford, which is a, uh, a mudstone or marl uh, shale unit. Yes. Mud rock unit. And then uh, these well Cinco Sauces, um, what is the total length that goes between the Buda and the Austin Chalk. That is about 400 feet. So it's the, the bottom depth, the current bottom depth. This doesn't necessarily mean this was the maximum burial for this rock unit, but this depth here is about uh, 4,020 feet. And then as we get up into the, uh, with the contact with the Austin Chalk, that's about uh, 3,600 feet uh, depth today. Excellent. And um, I always like to make this reference so that people understand what is the uh, geological clock, so to speak. Yeah. And uh, so we have two feet of core in each one of these pizza boxes. Uh, on average, I know this is an average, how many million, um, how many thousands of years do we have here? Yeah, so if we average it out, and the averaging technique is just like we said, we've got 400 feet of Eagleford, that's lower Eagleford and upper Eagleford, uh, deposited over approximately uh, 8 million years and so both uh, Carlos and I did some back of the envelope calculations and came up with uh, each two foot section represents 40,000 years 40, of uh, years. deposition. So that's the whole history of humanity. Yeah. And you might want to pause the video and uh, redo the calculations in case we got it wrong. Exactly, okay. But you know, just folks that are, are watching this video, just pay note, pay attention because you would take it for granted, but these rocks have been here for much more time than we have been here. So, um, so now we're going to take a walk through the different segments of the core, and we are going to make emphasis to a few things that are not 
available in the well logs. But I want to say something which is, uh, for Totti, this is uh, repeating things too much, but perhaps, but you know, we always, when we interpret well logs like this, we have to make sure that you understand that the resolution of these logs is not the same resolution of geological features. Things happen much more quickly in geological time. Uh, so that, you know, in this pizza box, we have to fit the core. And for logs, we have actually, especially triple combo or conventional logs, we have only four samples. So it's important to understand what happens in high resolution so that we can compare the log responses to the um, visual, visual um, features that we see in the core. So we're going to take a tour through all of these core. Thank you. Yeah, and this is the lower Eagle 4, correct? Yep. Yeah, so any, anyone on a, with a, uh, that's directing uh, uh, wells or, or drills would uh, easily pick up the uh, contact with the uh, lower Eagle 4 in the Buda if you hit it. Exactly. Ideally, you wouldn't hit it, though, because you drill really <laughs> your horizontals up from there. That's right. So right, this well, by the way, is a vertical well, so we have to realize that. Yes. To know. So let me walk through through you, and what you're going to see here is the uh, different portions of the Eagle Fort. You're going to see that this rock is by no means homogeneous. It has a lot of variability. In fact, you can recognize lots of um, laminations. The electrical resistivity tends to have an isotropy in the presence of these laminations, and you can also imagine what the mechanical competence of the rock is especially for hydrofracturing operations and also permeability and uh, storage that is brassy so let's continue to walk yeah and just notice as we're down in this lower section there's a lot more of these these limestone layers that are developed all throughout interbedded you know within the marls and then also some volcanic layers that you can uh, identify pretty clearly and you'll notice as we move up section we lose some of these limestone layers uh, as we go there that's a great point because some of these uh, layers have very important consequences on storage flow and geomechanics, but unfortunately they are too small to be seen by the well logs, and that's one of the reasons why we have to come and look at core. There's a lot of uh, shell fragments. This whole area has a lot of shell fragments. They're uh, inoceramid shells. This one here, we call it, it is a um, uh, inoceramid hash. It's a, a lot of uh, uh, inoceramid fragments all throughout here. Excellent. And then all of a sudden, as you move up section, there's there's much fewer rhinoceramids. It's telling you something was changing with the uh, depositional environment. And please remember that we're looking at this in one of the important um, aspects, uh, elements of the core that we want to look at is presence of organic material. Yeah. And uh, and this core, uh, please uh, totally correct me if I'm wrong, but this well produced gas, right? This one produced gas, yes. yes. Now, that's, now the, the depth that we're talking is about 4,000 feet. And that's not the um, that's the current burial depth. Uh, the maximum burial depth, based on um, maturity values that we measured, uh, was probably on the order of uh, 8,000 to nine thousand feet. Yeah. So there's been nearly uh, um, five thousand feet of uplift uh, yeah. since maximum burial. Correct. And if we if we had any liquid hydrocarbons, we would see stains and that sort of thing, right? Yes. But that's the reason why. Please uh, bear in mind that. We're looking at an important core, but this is in the overmature section of the Eagle Fort. It has gas, but it has organic content. So when you're drilling through these uh, rocks, the important thing is to understand presence of organic material, porosity, permeability, and also um, geomechanical potential. Because uh, even though this is a vertical well, eventually what uh, makes it producible financially viable or not is uh, drilling with a horizontal well. So we have to imagine that this is a key vertical well. It will give us an indication of where to direct the horizontal wells. Correct. Okay. Yeah, and we're kind of entering, uh, as we move up section, um, at the very base of the lower Eagle Ford, there was a very TOC rich interval. It sort of wanes a little bit in uh, what we just walked through. And now we're entering a, an area, it's a short area, where there's quite a bit of uh, TOC that's preserved. And that'll decrease as we go up core. Excellent. So as, you, as we walked uh, following Toddy here, Dr. Larson, sorry. <laughs> Just kidding, we always call each other names. But 
uh, we are actually going into younger rocks. That's correct. Younger rocks. Please pay attention to that. Yeah, and you can see quite a few uh, ash layers. Some of them really stand out, and some of them make you question if it, if it is an ash layer or something else. Keep in mind, depositionally, there would have been a lot of uh, bottom water currents that could have uh, intermixed uh, any ash deposits that would have uh, landed. And so sometimes you see them, uh, but sometimes they can be intermixed with the, uh, with the rock units. And where are these volcanoes from that produce the ash? Yeah, probably it's Cretaceous, so it's it's a time of high sea level. It's a time of uh, very high CO2 levels and a time of a lot of active volcanism. Uh, the um, uh, Pacific Plate, you know, off to the west, uh, was definitely one source of uh, volcanics, and there are isolated uh, large igneous provinces um, globally that, that exist at this time as well. But these probably originated uh, to the west. Um, in uh, present-day, you know, Nevada, Mexico. Okay, present Yellowstone, somewhere there. No, further south than that. Well, Although okay. there were definitely volcanoes, you know, arc, island arc type volcanoes uh, forming okay. up there at that time. Sometimes, actually, we see volcanic ash, even in the deep water Gulf of Mexico, by the way. But that's a different. Yeah, and there are volcanoes system. on the Comanche platform that were more active during the um, deposition of the Austin Chalk than in the Eagleford. But you know, these are these are research questions. Good. So we keep on walking. Please look at the core variability, yep. which is something that we cannot see from well logs over here. And also look at the differences in color. And now we're going to take a turn. Yes, yeah, so we'll go, go over there. Over there. So we walk to see. This is how core is laid out. So we have to keep track. Also, please note that all of these boxes, pizza boxes, are labeled. So they have their depth, so um, let me show you. If you want to uh, tie them with logs, you have to be careful how the depths are marked here. Yeah, and we, we do spend a lot of time uh, checking depths. Uh, what's mapped as a core depth isn't, doesn't necessarily match up with a, um, a wireline depth. Exactly. Ideally, it's within 10 feet, but this is a very good core, and there's a good agreement between these depths and uh, wireline depths. Um, that's not always the case. Exactly. We have to do depth matching all the time. All the time. Yes. Uh, it's a little more homogeneous section here. Uh, a, it's more massive mudstone, maybe a wacky stone, but it's a matrix-supported uh, mudrock system. Um, there's a really nice uh, pyrite grain, diagenetic, very large pyrite grain that formed. So there's a, there's a very important uh, diagenetic history in the Eagleford, and diagenesis, you know, it's going to control all the parameters that the uh, engineers are worried about. It's going to control the, uh, the the final porosity, certainly going to control the permeability. And also uh, some of the logs are affected by pyrite, uh, PEF, prolective factor resistivity. And uh, please note that these features are three-dimensional and the logs are not going to tell you that they are three-dimensional, so we have to take all of this with a grain of salt with uh, logs. Absolutely. So we're getting close to the, the top of the lower Eagleford, and this the lower Eagleford is where the, the horizontal wells are, are drilled in the uh, you know, Eagleford uh, play. And as we move up into the upper Eagleford, uh, we're gonna go into the, from the Cenomanian into the Tronian, and oceanographically, there are a lot of changes globally, and there's one that's referred to OEE2, Oceanic Ocean Anoxic Event 2. Did you guys capture that? <laughs> okay. Isn't this fun? Yeah, so I always have a, a lot of fun looking at core, by the way. Still a laminated uh, mudstone. And all of these labels that you have here, Toti, uh, the colorful labels, you guys did this because of a number of studies, right? Yep. Yeah, every, all the white labels here are where we make uh, x ray fluorescence measurements. And again, this is a, the archive half. So we can't perturb the surface. And so we can do a surface measurement of the X-ray fluorescence. And I use that in my geochemistry to help better characterize um, the organic matter richness and the mineralogy. You know, I build mineralogy models, do a lot of data analytics on that to build correlations from the, you know, the rock-based measurements to the wireline measurements. And then everywhere else, uh, there could be the uh, yellow ones. Yeah. X-ray diffraction measurements could be taken. Uh, Bambino is one that's very common to do uh, uh, rock hardness. I noticed that you guys don't use uh, magenta or purple here. I don't see any magenta or purple at all. Is that because you don't like Texas A&M? No, I look. <laughs> <laughs> look just, 
Just kidding you. <laughs> so look at these uh, geologists at the Bureau of Economic Geology are very well known for all the studies they've done on a number of places around the world. And this is no exception. I mean, they take a lot of pride in their work because they look at millimetric things and there's more that goes if you think that there's a lot of detail here, much more detail than well logs, I mean, you should see how they do thin sections, um, very detailed analysis of fabric, diagenesis, minerals, and fossils, all of those things are extremely important in the analysis. Yeah, that's right. And, you know, scaling is important to, to think about. And, you know, scaling is at all scales. In my science, you know, I worry about the scaling between the stickers. I have a lot of information that each one of those stickers and that's great, but I also work with people who do um, scanning electron microscopy to, to look at the, uh, the pore networks. And you know that is down to the submicron scale. And so trying to, to understand the resolution that we can get at the submicron scale and relate that to something that we can see at the, the two inch interval, and then try to take that to you know, a one meter interval, you know, those are all really important scales and there's, there's a lot of tools we can use, but it really, to, to build those correlations, um, it requires understanding the geologic framework. You know, what are the depositional systems? Because the, the, the depositional style is, is essentially going to be your, your primary tool to, to work in the, the, the other dimensions, you know, the three dimensions. Excellent. How are these, these rock types um, distributed? Well, the geologic processes are going to do that. Yeah, so one of the things that I tell my students is that uh, the well is a, it's a sampling, it's a restricted sampling that we have in one line. And the only way to extrapolate things away from the well is to know the geology. And that's exactly And that's right. the reason why you have to pay attention to so many of the things you do here. Yeah, a every way time to you walk through these cores, you learn another thing. You, yes. you observe another feature, and you, know, you might study this core and come back to it in six months. Well, in that six-month time, you've looked at a dozen other cores around it, and that's kind of feeding your, your mindset. It's right, yeah. And as a, as a scientist, any scientist really, trying to to capture that information, remember it, use it, and then apply it to the new cores that you look at. It's a, it's a constant struggle of, of but, looking at these complex data sets. But this is not only interesting, I mean, I, it's obviously very interesting from this point of view of science, but from a, com from a commercial financial perspective, it's also very important, right? Absolutely. Because we want to analyze storage flow, uh, total organic content and so forth, geomechanics, and all of those things that you guys see and analyze have impact on all of those properties, right? right. Yeah, if you want to make money out of the rocks, you got to know where the oil is yes. and uh, how you're going to get it to flow. Yes, excellent. So let's continue to walk here. Yeah, so now we're crossing up into the, um, the, the CT boundary, the Cenomanian Turonian boundary. So we're still in the Upper Cretaceous, but we're moving into the uh, Turonian. And this is the, a little further up, but... <laughs> well, actually... In, um, uh, it's still, it's the eagle bird. It still shares many similarities with the lower eagle bird. Uh, it's marley. It's uh, calcareous. There's a lot of uh, calcite throughout here. Um, there's a lot of uh, siliciclastic uh, input. So these are all plastic rocks, right? Uh, siliciclastic, yeah. So they're, they're carbonaceous with a siliciclastic component uh, mixing. Yeah, so, so it's really a... Pack of grains. Yeah, it's a mixing model between uh, calcite and uh, uh, quartz. And, and also and cement could be calcitic. Cal the cement, cement is almost always calcitic in yes. the uh, eagle bird. There's very yes. little uh, silicious cement. It's very important. But the one thing that's important, and you know, you would pick this up on the uh, the wireline logs, is that as we get into the upper eagle bird, we lose a lot of the uranium, and so that's indicative of losing a lot of the organics. And from the XRF measurements we've made, we also see a lot of uh, uh, indication of oxygenation. So the the ocean waters that were uh, in contact with these rocks during deposition were much more oxidizing than the lower eagle bird. Yes. And so there's no, there was no potential to uh, preserve the organics as they're being buried. And so these are typically uh, uh, very organic lean rocks. Oh, okay. Yeah, so the organic part, we left it uh, behind, but... Yep, we left it in the bottom. So that's uh, very important. It's probably storage potential. Yes. But you're lacking the, uh, the organics for the, that ingredient. And what, and what is the type of water that these rocks will hold? Is it very salty, fresh? Yeah, it's, it's um, I mean, these are marine, so these are uh, saltwater, you know, ocean deposits. Um, relatively deep. You know, if, if you look at some of the video we walked through, there's not a lot of evidence of, there's not a lot of ripples. 
it's a lot of just horizontally laminated, you know, clay sized to silt sized grains, uh, maybe up to kind of fine uh, sand sized grains, you know, 60 microns to upwards of 100 microns. So this is all low energy deposits. Um, presumably most of it is below uh, storm weight base. Yes. Um, so it's, it's a very low energy kind of deeper water. And we don't know the actual water depths. We kind of throw out 300 feet, but that's a, you know, that's a, a best guesstimate. Oh, okay. But not all the uh, environments will produce keratin or, or organics, right? No, no. no you have not. to have certain conditions for the uh, genesis in, yeah. of organic there is, material. There is some um, terrestrial input. There's somewhat of a terrestrial uh, signature on the organics, but largely it's dominated by marine. Yes. Then you can see some evidence of, you know, this looks like uh, there's been uh, some sort of a debris flow. You know, you can see larger grains that have been uh, transported. So there is some evidence here. It could be a slump, um, could be a you know part of a debris flow, some uh, sediment gravity flow. So there is some higher energy environments uh, that are and, being recorded. And by the way, this is very important because some of these features that Todd is uh, indicating, they are not visible with well logs. Probably not. And yet, they have important impact on storage flow geomechanics so it's very important to understand this yeah there's there's quite a few of them i mean you see a lot of these different uh, features that we didn't see sedimentary features that we didn't see down in the uh, lower eagle bird yes that's what i always tell my students that their best friend should be a geologist because <laughs> they see rocks with a totally different um, universe with different eyes with different senses and it's a collaborative Problem, that's exactly sure. yes that's what I would love to to hear more collaborative and then all of a sudden it looks like we're back in the lower eagle bird I see some uh, pyrite um, you know it's it's darker overall uh, presumably that's that's related to silicic plastic input but you do have to be careful these cores the surfaces of the cores do oxidize and so yes. you, you, the color that you see uh, may may uh, be deceiving to you exactly and so when we do our detailed studies we'll go by and we'll um, scrub the cores to kind of clean off the surface. How old is this core, uh, Todi, by the way? Uh, I think this was taken about eight years ago, nine eight years ago. Yes. Yeah, so relatively young. It's a good core. So it's, a, it's one of our few cores that we have that's continuous uh, from the Buda through the entire you know, lower and upper Eagle Verge section and into the, uh, the base of the Austin Chalk. And not only that, but you have all the logs. We have all the logs and yes. it's been studied by so many people because it's continuous. So yes. this has just become a very rich data set for us. Exactly. So even though it's in the gas window, you know, it may not be economically that important. The information that you can gain by studying this particular core uh, is it's very, very a lot. important. Yes. We always come back to the cinco sauce. Cinco sauces. Cinco sauces. <laughs> okay, so now, yeah, so we'll go back here. So we're still in the uh, upper Eagleford. Yeah, so now we're turning, but still yeah, younger, right, younger rocks. We're going into younger rocks. Going into younger rocks, yeah. So we're gonna, as we hit the Austin Chalk, We'll be in that sort of 90 million years ago to um, 89 million years ago. And I see a lot of variability here in this section. A lot of variability. Yeah, so the, the, these layers that are, these white layers that are uh, 4M rich, uh, you're seeing a lot more of them. Um, that's telling you that there's a, there's a change in the depositional environment. I still think a lot of these are uh, concretions that form, they're diagenetic in origin. Yes. Um, but we would need a thin section to really look to understand the, um, the type of calcite yeah. that's there. So the well logs here in this example would be more variable, reflecting uh, the variability of the rocks, whereas in other sections like this, where things are a little bit more homogeneous, more constant, the logs will be also const more, um, less variable, let's say. Yeah, and that's something that we see pretty common with the, the wireline picks that we make with the, uh, the upper Eagleford and the Austin Chalk. There's um, sort of a series of fingers that you can, uh, you can view a lot more uh, sedimentary features. Looks like some uh, some ripples may be forming. I see some, you know, that some slumping that uh, slump deposits that may have formed. And so we still have volcanics here. Yeah, some volcanic layers here. And then the wireline log, as you get to the uh, top of the Eagleford, there's definitely a series of uh, uh, gamma spikes. Uh, and then you guys did all these thin sections that we see photographs here, right? Yep, exactly. This is a, a project that uh, one of the geologists I love to collaborate with, uh, Bob Laux. Yeah, he's very well. He's very famous. Yeah, and he's Bob has carried on a, a really large project on the uh, Austin Chalk, and spends a lot of time characterizing the uh, the pore networks. And um, you can see that even these sections show a lot more variability than we can see. 
Yeah, and thing. it's really important to look at thin section because that's where you're gonna, you know, we can say, and both Carlos and I have said it, all oh, these calcite rich layers, but that doesn't tell you what type of calcite. And sure. so you want to go back and understand, you know, are these are these foram rich layers, or is it uh, calcite cement? Well, you get that information from thin section. Yes. So, so a lot of variability. And also, the, please look at the way the rock is broken up. That's also indicative of the mechanical properties. Yeah, the parting surfaces really uh, start to show. Most likely, this well was drilled with water-based mud, right? Because I don't see any staining. That could be. I don't. I'm not, I don't know. Okay. And this is the top. Yeah, so it's the top port. of the uh, top of the eagle bird. And so now we're crossing into the um, Austin Chalk. Into the Austin Chalk. And so many companies are now drilling into the Austin Chalk. I, there's a town in Texas called Cuero. Uh, there are many operators there drilling into the Austin okay. Chalk. Yeah, a lot of storage potential. So it's fractured oil. And so the oil that is in the Austin Chalk comes from the Eagle Four, right? It's a mixture of both. It's definitely charged from, you know, there's definitely evidence, geochemical evidence, that the oils were sourced out of the lower Eagle Herd. But the Austin Chalk does produce in situ as well. And so part of the story that we're trying to interpret is, you know, what the percentage of oil from the lower Eagle Herd versus the Austin Chalk you know, exists in, in the Austin Chalk and how that varies across the plate. You said something very unique and very important here. So you guys, geochemists, you also look at the molecules of um, hydrocarbon, right? That's correct. To understand the genesis and compartments. Yep. Uh, we want to know the, the type of organics and we want to know uh, the maturity of the organics. And so we do, we've set up here at the BEG uh, a whole lab to do uh, biomarkers. And that yes. helps us uh, trace the sources of uh, produced gases or produced oils. So you can, you can for instance, if, if you see any, um, for lack of a better word, the same DNA in the oil, in the Eagle Fort and Austin Chalk, then you can say that it's coming from the Austin Chalk, right? Most exactly. likely. Yeah, that's how we make our mixing ratios. Yes. So we'll work with companies to, um, companies will provide us with uh, producing fluids or produce fluids. And from that, we'll do a biomarker uh, work to try to tie the, um, just to look at what the, the variability is, but also start to look at some uh, compartmentalization. Now, how different are the produced fluids uh, across the plate? And yeah, what does that tell us about where they're sourced? And importantly, uh, how much transport uh, occurred to get those oils there? That's excellent. It's very important. All of these components, now that you guys have a, know something about the geological, the petroleum systems, all of them are very important to understand, to make money, actually, to make a financially viable decisions. Hey, one thing you can see in the Austin shop that I think stands out compared to the uh, Egoford is that you know you get a this is a, a a great you know two two foot sections of of chalk, but then you see these these thin layers of uh, argillaceous you know presumably TOC rich uh, layering, and so you see a lot more of this kind of uh, high percentage of calcite you know chalks or marley chalks that are separated with these little thin argillaceous layers, and you can see that developing um, across the chalk play. Another thing you can see is uh, at least I can see you know by looking at it is there's a lot of bioturbation. So there's a lot of worm burrows. And for that to, to happen, it means that there's a lot more oxygen um, in, during the depositional environment. And so it's, it's much more um, oxygenated than what we saw in the lower Eagleford. We saw very little evidence of any uh, bioturbation. But then you get these thin intervals of, um, of more uh, argillaceous layers. And so are these the, argilla are these the, uh, the layers that are sourcing uh, part of the Austin chalk? Yeah, I think so. But that's, uh, that's research that's, that's in progress. Point. And also I want to point out that when we were looking at the um, Buda and Eagle Ford, the contrast in log responses was very high. It's like a discontinuity. Mm -hmm. But when we came from the Eagle Ford into the Austin chart, the boundary was more diffuse. Oh yeah, it's a confusing boundary. Yes. It's not straightforward and it changes. Uh, the nature of that contact between the upper eagle herd and the Austin Chalk uh, yeah. changes across the plate. And we will see that also reflected on the logs. I bet. That's actually very good. Keep in mind, it's still a chalk, but it's not like the Dover Whitecliffs chalk. I mean, it's a it's a pretty dirty chalk. Um, even in the in the chalky layers, there's still quite a bit of a silicic plastic component. You know, anywhere from uh, five to ten percent uh, silicic plastic uh, within the chalk, and then you get these thin argillaceous layers uh, throughout. 
We don't see nearly as many uh, discrete volcanic layers as we did see in the uh, Eagle Perk. But keep in mind, those um, they could be here. They could just be intermixed uh, throughout because there's been a lot of bioturbation. The Austin chalk does it outcrop near Austin, Texas? Uh, on the if you're on the east side of the Balcones Fault, then uh, we're standing on top of the uh, Austin chalk. And okay. then as you yeah, as you work uh, further like, south, you can see outcrops. Like on Mount Bonnell. Uh, there you cross the um, uh, the Balcones, and there you're up on the um, kind of lower lower Cretaceous. Yes. And that. Uh, this is just for my own, and so also for, for yeah, the, the students. Yeah, crops that we see are uh, further north, like up in uh, Waco. Yes. And then, would, would any of these formations uh, function as an aquifer? Um, the Edwards, for sure. Um, I don't know where they're producing water out of the Austin Chalk that's uh, potable. I don't know the answer to that. Okay. Yeah, I don't know. That's interesting. I hope, you know, because we have some students that do geohydrology. Yeah. And I always go back to aquifers and things of that sort. Here's some nice uh, bioturbation. So you can see these, uh, you know, evidence of worm burrows uh, throughout. That's really important to know. You know, you need oxygen to uh, to host uh, worms, and so it tells you something about the um, the oceanographic chemistry conditions. And they also produce porosity permeability, right? Oh yeah. So that's the reason why it's important to look at. And as we make our way to the top of the Austin Chalk, it's important to understand that this is not a complete core of the Austin Chalk. And, you know, in the Austin Chalk play in particular, a lot of the cores that we have that contain Austin Chalk, they weren't cored for the Austin Chalk. They were yes. cored for the Eagle Bird. Yes. So a lot of our understanding or core studies of the Austin Chalk really is just showing us the, the bottom, you know, maybe the bottom 100 feet or so of the Austin Chalk. We do have continuous cores of Austin Chalk, but they're uh, less common. And so, yeah. again, working with someone like Carlos, working with, with uh, engineers to take the wireline logs that will cross the entire Austin Chalk, but then use the information that we can get from just that, that bottom core interval is uh, something we're always doing. Yeah, so, so there's, there are many messages to, to this talk, and I want to thank Toddy for spending time with us. He's an excellent human being, person, <laughs> excellent scientist, and like many at the Bureau, they're always very um, eager to work with us, so I appreciate that. And this is one of the things that we do here with them. And um, they give us a different perspective of everything. And, and everything is important to properly understand how we can make money out of these rocks if that's what we're looking for uh, from a financial context, so to speak. So we have seen a lot of things. We have seen a core going from Austin Chalk to Buda Formation, Eagle Fort, and we have seen the tremendous variability. We have seen content, organic content. We have also seen presence of fractures, presence of organic life, volcanic material, um, variability in the rock composition. All of these things are going to be present in the well logs, but not with the same um, resolution. So we have to be mindful about that. Well, thank you so much, uh, Toddy. I appreciate your time. You're very kind. No, and I'm just honest. going to walk very fast through here to recreate what we did here so that everybody sees distances, time, thicknesses, variability as we move into the top Eagle 4 now. Look at the variability. Please uh, remember that each one of these pizza boxes covers about approximately 40,000 years of age but please remember that things are not moving uniformly so some of the segments are accumulated faster than others so it's important to remember that because that has an important impact on all the petrophysical properties that we look at for from the context of well logs um, and please look at the variability all of these cores have been organized properly into depths and they are all brought back here so that folks like us can look at them compare the logs to depth matching understand the log responses because uh, this well has core but there are other wells that do not have core and we don't have the luxury of looking at all of these things 
So we use key welds. Key welds are the welds that have core samples like this one. And so that we can tie well logs, understand the variability properties, so that hopefully if we go to another weld that has only logs, we can use a key weld to benchmark our analysis and to understand, to link, to correlate all of these properties. And uh, please take note of this incredibly variable um, formation, the equal fourth. And now we're going to the beautiful boundary with the view that formation, where we have a very strong discontinuity. And in fact, the most organic material, the, the richest organic component of the um, Eagle Fort, the lower Eagle Fort, is precisely very close to the boundary of the Buda Formation. And we can see that also from the logs. Uh, so it's important to, to uh, correlate the log responses with the core. Um, there are several features in the logs. We're looking at the gamma ray log, resistivity logs, neutron density logs, and then spectral gamma ray logs, and then we're also looking at permeability. So this core has been analyzed ad nauseum with all kinds of different measurements because we want to understand the variability of the rock. But look at this, at this boundary, there's a very drastic difference between the gamma ray log within the Eagle Fort and the view that formation. And then we come and see other sections of this rock and now we come into a section which is also oil stained, but this is now the Buda Formation. And the Buda Formation output is not far from Austin, Texas. Well, thank you so much, uh, Toddy. I appreciate your time. You're very kind. And this concludes part four, the final part of the video lectures on core log integration. Thank you so much for your attention and thank you so much to Dr. Totti Larson for his time, experience, motivation for sharing his superb knowledge about organic mud rocks and experience with measurements in the laboratory and geology. Thank you so much Totti for your time. Greatly appreciate it.